to check in the volume. Do I sound like there's two of me? Or just one of me? Oh, I think it's only one. Hey, Lucius. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, friends, gotta get started. Hi. I hope you're having a good day. It is so warm outside um, that it is super warm inside. <laughs> and I've had the air conditioning on all day and uh, I've been sweating away in the kitchen. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Lucius, for subscribing for the second month in a row. Thank you. Um, hello. I had a whole, like, beginning thing. Okay, so... Welcome back to Attack the Pantry. I'm Jen De La Vega. I guess that's like the first time I've called this stream by its title, but that's its name. That's what I decided to call it. Feels weird, but necessary. Like a lot of things. Um, I'm so hyped today. I was very, very busy, and you'll see why. Um, can you tell I'm hyped and that I had a tea? <laughs> um, so last time on the Wednesday stream, we talked about poaching eggs how to poach a bunch at once, and how eggshell biodegradable packaging is made. There are two different ways that are really interesting, but not yet in mass production, and I hope that we get to it soon, because I think it's really important to have more biodegradable material as we rely more on delivery and single-serve things in quarantine. Yes, got political. <laughs> how are we doing in the chat? Glad to see ya. Hello. Um, so, if you're new to the channel, you can watch all the clips if you click on videos. I always uh, cut up all the streams into highlights after each stream session uh, so that you can find all of the ingredients and magazines that I talk about individually so you don't have to like scroll through or anything. Um, Twitch also deletes stuff after two weeks. I'll be uploading the archive to youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V tonight after I finish streaming. You can subscribe there to um, catch up on all the streams as well as my skate videos that go up every Monday. I can't believe that I'm already up to 12. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, here, Twitch, Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Eastern. And on Sundays, um, I have a stream called Zine Dreams. And this past Sunday, we looked at Put an Egg on It number 8. It's the first issue where I make a physical appearance, like in photos. Um, that was over seven years ago. Pretty crazy. We also looked at an independent zine called Overseasoned by Amy Larson. We also dissected the ads in um, Shape Magazine's latest issue. It was so weird and off topic, but really enlightening. Um, it was mailed to me by mistake, <laughs> and I returned it yesterday. 
Um, we also looked at the holiday issue, holiday 2012 issue of Bon Appetit magazine. Um, really interesting stuff. It, there's a huge difference between their online content now in 2020 versus what they were printing in 2012. Um, and there is some Alison Roman, you know, sprinkled throughout. Uh, and I said my piece about that. Anyway, yes. So, like I said at the beginning, uh, I am now a Twitch affiliate. You can connect your Amazon Prime account to Twitch and support uh, one creator a month on Twitch. So if you connect your account, you can choose me or choose another favorite. You know, I, I get that there might be other favorites. <laughs> but what that does is every subscription, every attachment to Amazon Prime gives Twitch streamers a little bit of money every week. Currently clocking in at a few cents per week, which is still something. It's not nothing. Yes, uh, there's also lots of good links below the video here. Uh, one way to help me out for free is to share some of them on social media so other folks can join in on the fun with us here. Um, oh, Martin, you made it. It's hot there. How hot is it? Is it 80 degrees in the Bay Area? Nasty. Like today, I, today was the first time I had to turn on the AC. Um, I usually hold out a little bit longer, but, um, yeah, it's only mid-70s here, but I have a slow cooker going, I have a rice cooker next to me, I've been running the dehydrator all day, I was deep frying and, like, braising a bunch of stuff. I'll show you about that, I'll show you all that in a minute, but, um, yeah, I just had the whole kitchen going today and had to turn on the AC because I was just sweating so much and I changed my shirt, my goodness, my goodness. Um, but yeah, 80s in the Bay Area, woof! Woof, guys, woof. Um, let's see, what else is happening? We have a new episode of Fun City coming out this Friday. It's episode number 18, which feels like a lot. You know, I it was crazy when I was looking forward to episode one coming out. Like, there was a six-month difference between us recording this podcast and then uh, actually getting it out the door. So... Uh, maybe it was nine months, nine months between recording and uh, releasing. And so now that we're on episode 18, which I, oh my gosh, we recorded this um, before quarantine started. And it we have our fir very, very first guest star, uh, my friend Anthony Carboni, who is also a streamer on Twitch and um, largely famous for doing Star Wars stuff. He's like on the Star Wars, he hosts the Star Wars show and, and, and things like that. Um, but he loves games and loves Shadowrun and we asked him to come through on Fun City. So um, you'll hear a preview tomorrow on our Patreon. Um, that's patreon.com slash funcityventures. Um, we're gonna release a short clip of him introducing his character. And what's really funny is, um, you know, as we play Shadowrun, we, we didn't, since he's our first guest, we, we didn't really know what he was going to do. And so there was this 30-minute chunk where we were waiting outside while Anthony was recording his own little session with Mike and Taylor. So it's really fun. You're going to get the ex excerpt tomorrow, and then the full episode comes out on Friday. And it sounds like we're going to have a two-parter. So I, I can't wait for you to hear the whole thing. Um, I'm really proud of it. And Anthony was kind of the last out-of-town friend that I saw um, before quarantining. So it's extra special to me. Yeah. Hey, Matt. <laughs> yeah, we have our first guest star on Friday's episode. It is Anthony Carboni. You may have seen him tweeting about it today. So that's Fun City News. Um, so uh, I was supposed to be a guest on Critical Bits last Friday, but we rescheduled to this Friday at 8 p.m. We're playing a small, uh, it's not a one-shot. Technically, for me, it is a one-shot because I'm only there for one episode, but um, they have an ongoing game of Pasión de las Pasiones, uh, which is a telenovela-themed tabletop game. I'm joining as Elena Oriada. Uh, bring on the telenovela drama vibes. Can't wait. To use my Duolingo skills that I've been putting off. Like, I've never really had a good Duolingo streak. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, so that's Friday at 8pm. Hopefully, if it's nicer this weekend, I'll stream some sounds 
uh, from the back patio, but um, it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow and Friday, <laughs> whatever. Um, don't forget, there's a free pantry guide on Patreon. If you want more ingredients on there, please message me um, and I will add it. Um, last week I posted about cast iron fajitas. Bring the Applebee's to you at home. It's not that hard if you have a cast iron pan. Um, this morning I shared a kimchi pork chop. You can either use ready-made kimchi paste or use chopped up kimchi to marinate your pork chops like you would chicken. So uh, it's really fascinating and delicious and spicy and a little funky, um, but really, really fun. It's a good way to, you know, shake things up. Um, the reason why I'm like sweaty and like running around a lot today is because I launched a local pickup and delivery service as I'm testing recipes. Um, that is a freelance thing that I do for work. Like I've been really lucky this week that I, I landed some recipe testing gigs. And so I'm rushing to, to deadline and, and testing like maybe six recipes and um, my fridge does not have enough space. So I've been trying to get rid of it by selling it. <laughs> I'll show you what it looks like in a second. Um, yeah, slowly working on culinary word of the day. It's taken a little bit of a backseat because of the new work that's come in. Yay work, yay paid work. Um, but yeah, more work on that next week. Uh, I'll talk about this when I get to the video. Um, so yeah, if Patreon, Twitch sub, or Etsy isn't possible for you and you wanna tip me for good cooking advice, my Venmo slash PayPal is below. Or again, tell a friend to subscribe here or on Instagram. It's all nice and free and helps creators that you love. Yeah. So let's let's look at the things that I was up to this week. Um, no, Martin, uh, Pasión de las Pasiones is not all in Spanish, but is encouraged to use a lot of Spanglish. Hee. <laughs> I've already written a couple of lines that I'm excited to say. I won't spoil anything. But my player is gonna be La Doña, so she's gonna be the mom. <laughs> if you can imagine me being a mom. Well, I'm trying not to do this thing where I, I have this like, cheaty tendency to make all other RPG characters a lot like the first one, so I, <laughs> maybe I should do like a child next time. I keep basing people off of Viv and Stevie Nicks. It's not a bad thing, it's just really easy to recall and pretend to know how they act. I don't know. Anyway, let's check out what I did this week. This is all very exciting. Um, Etsy update, um, the, f the newest item is Toffee Crumble, which is mostly made of graham cracker. There are bits of pepita, cacao nibs, and dried plum. It's a sweet sprinkle that you can put on ice cream, on cakes, on pancakes. Um, yeah, it's, it's just like a sugary sweet crumble. It's not very crunchy until you get to the cacao nibs and pepitas, but um, I'm keeping it in the freezer for now so that when it ships, it's like, I don't know, extra fresh. I don't know, it's just really hot outside and I just don't want to risk mailing things that are, that could melt. Yeah, so, I mean it won't melt unless it reaches like 400 degrees or something, but not likely in a, in a USPS truck. Or not, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's the Etsy store. Um, this is what I've been working on all week. Um, I put a shop up on Shopify for all my fresh food. Um, this is a little outdated because I sold out of a few things, like the Burmese salad, but I have lots of meatballs and um, added two kinds of soup. Um, milaga, which is a bone marrow soup with beef and cabbage and corn, and then um, what else? And chicken tonola, which is kind of like my, uh, my culture's version of like, grandma's chicken soup. It's like ginger, fresh turmeric, um, chayote, chicken, soft poached chicken. Here we can look at it again, here. Uh, but yeah, if you go to randwitches.myshopify.com, this is where it is. You can see the, the inventory. Um, don't DM me to coordinate delivery. I will reach out to you. <laughs> Please go through the store. <laughs> Thank you for checking it out. Um, I sold out of them already, but this is what the Burmese salad looks like. I got really homesick for the Bay Area, um, and so this is my take on a Burmese salad. It's pescatarian. 
Um, it's got in the middle, which is really, really exciting, a fermented green tea uh, dressing that has like ginger and garlic mixed in with olive oil. Um, we have roasted butternut squash with Urfa pepper, uh, fresh calamansi from my Auntie Ellen's tree that I've been rationing, but I'm giving one away with every salad. <laughs> We have small whole blue oyster mushrooms that I've glazed in miso in the top left corner, radishes, and then some sauteed chickpea flour over the bed of cabbage. So um, I really love this salad myself. I'm not even a salad person, but um, I find this very delicious and refreshing, especially during like a, a hot day like today. Um, but yeah, that's the Burmese salad uh, based on my travels to the Bay Area. Yeah. Oh, we're talking about Duolingo still. Uh, Matt says, I still haven't broken that streak. Played the same. Oh, Tiefling Warlock. They're not talking about Duolingo. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, Tiefling Warlock in the last six D&D &D games. Huh? Yes. Tieflings. I'm learning so much about D&D &D from Rude Tales and Magic. I was not familiar before this. Um, let's see. So, I mentioned one of the soups earlier has fresh turmeric in it. I didn't, I... I was testing a recipe and it called for fresh turmeric root and I kind of didn't know what I was looking for so I had to google it uh, and luckily the sea town in my neighborhood had some they came in like well I think it's in the fridge right now but um, there are these little roots and they kind of get stored by the ginger in the in the grocery store if your grocery store has it this is what it looks like um, they're like really short. They're not like hand size like a, a piece of ginger is, but turmeric is like finger size, but still has that like rhizome appearance. And um, all you need to do is wash them and then uh, grate them. And the skin just kind of blends in there. It doesn't really matter if you eat the skin. Um, you might want to cut off any like hard knobs or anything like that, but this is my uh, Japanese grater. Uh, that I got I think from either Daiso or Muji I don't remember which one I got it from but you can find it at most uh, Japanese vendors um, you just kind of swirl it in a circle and it grates and then falls into a little trough isn't that cute I love it I'm also just like not going back to powdered turmeric after this like this stuff is so fresh and nice but it also dyes your fingers orange I don't know you can't really tell because I'm so brown but like <laughs> My fingernails were quite yellow yesterday. <laughs> so yeah, that's fresh turmeric. Also in my store is, uh-oh, did we lose you? I think we lost a, a, a kimchi photo. But there's a kimchi and Asian pear photo in there somewhere. Um, this was so exciting. I got a delivery of Filipino groceries. I found a shop in Staten Island that delivers to Brooklyn. Um, and so I was able to get a lot of ingredients for things I was testing this week. Um, my favorite snack there is in the middle, the Nagaraya garlic cracker peanuts. They're so good. There's so much MSG, but who cares? <laughs> There's, I've also got like some fish crackers. We're going to talk about this later, but I got Tocino flavored Spam. This is for my demonstration later. We're going to have our de first demonstration on here. No, second demonstration. We steamed dumplings one time. Um, yeah. Oh, I drank all that calamansi juice already. <laughs> Doesn't last long around me. Like, seltzer and calamansi juice, like, I'll drink it so fast. Like, day of. <laughs> uh, for dinner one night, I made roast beef flautas. This was hilariously easy to do. Anyone can make these. Uh, if you get, you know, a, a flour tortilla... You put some, uh, you rip up a few, two slices of like, uh, you know, just roast beef from, from a package and then roll it up and then deep fry that in like, like an inch of vegetable oil, um, flip it over after like two minutes and they're all brown like this. And I dipped it in like a spicy mayo and that, that was my dinner. There's like cilantro there, but I really didn't do anything fancy to it. Um, it was very satisfying. Like I want to make more flautas more often. It's also a good vehicle for leftovers, right? Right? Yeah. Doesn't it look great? It's not fancy. You can do it yourself. Um, graphic warning. This is a beef shank. <laughs> this was for a recipe 
um, called Nilaga that I'm testing, which is a bone marrow broth based soup. It's very healing and very like fulfilling. Um, but this is from a, a, a cow's femur. And so they're, if you can imagine, these discs fit together like in a ball. And so they're sliced crosswise so that we get a big piece of bone marrow in the middle. Um, and that makes the broth super oily, slick, and delicious. And then this is what the final soup looks like. So there's the bone marrow, the beef that's super soft after cooking for like two hours. Um, a medallion of corn, leek, potato, turnip, uh, cabbage, a little bit of rice in the middle. And then um, just finished with some pepper. There's only like fish sauce, a little salt, and pepper. Like nothing else, nothing special. Um, and this is one way I like to recover from hangovers. <laughs> All right, that's what I was up to this week. Let's see what everybody else was up to this week. Let's see. Dylan made a buffalo pizza. This is a, a buffalo style pizza on a whim because we have a group chat <laughs> over text message with a couple of my other friends and um, it's only for food sharing. I don't really like to participate in a lot of other food sharing like social media groups because I get overwhelmed. But if it's just like a few of my close friends, um, it's been really fun because these guys try to like one up each other all the time. And so <laughs> Vance, by the way. The reason why Dylan made this pizza at like 9 p.m. one night is because uh, Vance was making like gnocchi. <laughs> Which is super fancy. This looks professional. Looks like it belongs in a cookbook. My goodness. And did you know how easy it is to make gnocchi yourself? Um, it is basically a peeled potato, boiled. You drain that. You mash it up with like, you know, a couple tablespoons of flour. And that's gnocchi dough. And it's a matter of shaping after that. You use a fork or like um, the face of like a meat tenderizer mallet. Um, or you could just roll them up and cut it. Honestly, they're just like pillows. You can cut them any size. Then you boil them until they float. And if they fall apart, which they have done on account, you know, many accounts of mine, <laughs> um, you just knead in a little bit more flour and then recut them. It's, it's not that bad. Um, it's really fun. What else? So this is Vance's gnocchi. Uh, my brother actually shared a photo with me today. Oh, no, not today. Recently. Um, he really loves cheesecake. He has such a big sweet tooth. But this is a peanut butter cheesecake with a chocolate ganache topping. And uh, I mailed him a care package a couple weeks ago, and he put an egg on it. You can see the tiny, tiny sticker at the, at the top. <laughs> you see that tiny, tiny sticker? I'm going to make it bigger. It's not on the counter next to it. It's on the cake. <laughs> it made my day. Isn't that funny? Isn't that? Yeah, it looks very, very decadent. Whoa, there's 11 people in here. Hi, everybody. Hey, Eric. Nice to see you. Eric says I can go through like half a bag of garlic cracker nuts in one sitting. I know. I have to like um, stop myself because... First of all, it's like super salty and like I get all <laughs> like <laughs> parched and I'm like, but I can't stop. <laughs> I was really proud of myself for not finishing the package yesterday. <laughs> the best part is that your fingers are covered in like the MSG garlic powder and you're like, it's disgusting, but like, yeah, I totally lick my fingers after that. Um, and then Martin, I hope you don't mind. I put, I have your egg pop here for everybody to watch. If you have egg pops, you can send them to me. This is slow mo egg pop. The egg porn channel. Don't report me, please. <laughs> this is so amazing. Thank you for sending me egg porn. <laughs> it's still going. <laughs> Amazing. Ooze. Yeah. Thank you for sending that. It was so great. That's so great. So good. And if you want to be featured on the stream, um, tag me in your Instagram or Twitter posts or DM it to me. I'd love to share your progress, your 
fails, you know, your successes, um, really weird things that you see at the store. If you're curious, I want to look, I want to look, I want to see. Um, yeah, so that's what all of us have been doing this week. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's do sound check. Does it sound okay? Can you hear the twinkles still? Do I sound like I'm phasing again or is it okay? Let's put an egg on me for right now. Egg on me! Love putting an egg on me. So fun. How are we doing in the chat? Are we okay? I hope that everybody's staying safe. Oh, thank you, Lucius. Sounds, sounds good. Cool. Well, let's get to our first topic. We have three, three big topics today and, um, and a demonstration, which I'm really excited about because it's, um, you know, I'm hungry. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, yeah, Matt, I know training for a new job is, is crazy making, but I am also kind of going through that as well. Um, you know, trying to find a new routine, like starting a store and then trying to be an editor in chief for the first time. Like, I kind of don't know how to, how to do that, but, uh, I'll get there. Oh, what? Lucius just cooked some salmon and made asparagus ohitashi. Oh, I don't know what ohitashi is. What's ohitashi? Well, we will talk about asparagus. So cool. All right, everybody. Um, we're gonna start with Carol's question about tofu. Let's dive deep into tofu. Let's understand it. What do we think about tofu in the chat? Do you like it? Do you hate it? You know, do you have a way that you like to prepare it? I'll get into the ways that I like to prepare it because there was a follow-up question that goes with this one. Um, but let me know what you think about tofu as I go through the nitty-gritty about it, all right? Um, it's also known as bean curd. It is essentially coagulated soy milk that has been pressed into curds sometimes. Sometimes pressed into curds. Does that sound familiar? It sounds kind of like cheese. <coughs> Most people say that tofu is boring and has no flavor, but sure, yeah, I think, though, it's meant to to be that way, you know? Think of it as a blank canvas, your vehicle for transporting things. Um, it can absorb sauces very well and fill you up on account of its large amount of protein. Tofu was first recorded over 2,000 years ago during the Han Dynasty. Isn't it, that's a long time ago, dude. Like, whoa. It made its way to Japan during the Nara period. That means around uh, year 700. And then it radiated throughout Southeast Asia with the spread of the vegetarian Buddhism diet. Um, it didn't actually make its way to America until about a thousand years later. Can you imagine a thousand years of innovation and Benjamin Franklin's the first American to mention tofu? Like, we are always so behind. Yeah. Matt, Matt just said, oh man, Buddhism's history is insane. True, true, true. And Martin says, I like the texture, but taste is boring. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. There are ways around this. But going back to Benjamin Franklin, in a 1770 letter to John Bartram, he encountered it during a trip to London, of all places, and included a few soybeans, and he referred to it as cheese from China. So I'm not wrong in referring to tofu as like a cheese thing, kind of, kind of. So um, the first tofu factory in the US was built in 1878, another hundred years later. Like Americans were very slow to adopt. Like China's had it for over 2000 years. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Everyone else, <laughs> get, on the to get on the tofu train. There are so many different ways we can eat tofu. <laughs> yeah, all right. Eric says, love tofu, so versatile. Made taho with silken, with silken tofu a couple weeks ago and then a pack of ramen with later that night. Nice, getting your protein and mixing up the textures. That's kind of a secret to enjoying it is, is changing up the texture. Um, yes. 
glad to hear it, guys. Um, so how is it made? Essentially, it's the preparation of soy milk. So we get tofu from soy milk. And then from soy milk, we add some kind of coagulant, just like in cheese. In cheese, it's called a rennet, um, which is harvested from the fourth stomach of a ruminant animal. Um, but here, the coagulation is different because of the chemical makeup of of soy you know it's it cheese comes from an animal so it has like consummate parts that go with animal digestive tract things and so soybean does not come from an animal and so it will coagulate from different sorts of chemical things anyway so it forms curds and then a third optional step to make different kinds of soy soy product is to press it or um drain it drain all that that water from it so typical tofu making procedures, cleaning, soaking, grinding beans in water, filtering, boiling, the coagulation process, process that I just said, and pressing. So, 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 uh, the way we coagulate the protein uh, is by boiling the soy milk. And there are several different coagulants or things that separate the solids from the liquids. Um, there are a couple of salt coagulants specifically calcium sulfate or known as gypsum in Chinese culture. There is also chloride type salts or nigari or lushui salts. There is also an acid coagulant called glucona delta lactone, GDL. Um, and this is really fascinating. There's an enzyme coagulant uh, like papain. Papain is something that I've been studying. It is the enzyme, the meat tenderizing enzyme in papayas. Crazy. It's, it, it, instead of like coagulating tofu into like big chunks, um, papain's result is more of like a, a gelling agent, like instant tofu, you know, uh, jello situation. Um, so it results in like different textures. That's like fascinating to me. Fascinating. Um, so there are, you know, four general types of tofu. There is extra soft, which is unpressed. Um, in Korea, sometimes that means it's like the soy milk is just mixed with seawater and it has a loose texture, like it's not filtered at all. Um, or it's mixed with a highly saline solution and um, kind of just a loose, like, Kind of like that tao texture, like you were, you were talking about. Um, the next one is silken. That's like a little bit more of a, of a solid tofu. It's gelled with that gypsum stuff that I was talking about. Um, so this is coagulating the soy milk without cutting the curd. So this silken tofu is really good in smoothies, baked desserts, um, mostly fresh applications. Serious Heats has a great great recipe for um, silken tofu with chili oil and soy sauce and scallion yeah it's a good breakfast thing to have it's so good and nice and cold on a hot day right right has anyone had that before um okay so we've already said extra soft silken and then firm tofu so depending on the amount of water that is extracted from each cut um this tofu is pressed into curds um, so they can be firm grade or extra firm. And extra firm just means that more of the moisture has been pressed out. So you'll know that when you open a pack of tofu from the store, it's completely immersed in water so that it maintains its moisture content and freshness. Um, that brine is used to slow down bacterial growth. So, um, don't buy tofu that is like not fresh tofu that is not in liquid. Anything that has been smoked or pre-treated, fine, you know, as long as it's refrigerated, but like be wary of open containers of tofu. Like I know that in some wet markets, they, ser they sell tofu just in a barrel that you can just get with tongs. Like take some of the liquid <laughs> if you're gonna buy from something like that. Um, yeah, so extra firm tofu is most likely similar to paneer or Indian cheese. Um, so there are lots of ways you can treat tofu. I mean, it's been around for thousands of years. It comes in jars as a pickled product. It can be fermented, which I think is so, so good. Spicy fermented tofu is a little pungent. Um, 
but really great over rice. What else? Um, there are two interesting byproducts when you're making soy milk and tofu. So you know how uh, when you make cheese, there's byproducts of whey. So we, we, you know, sift the curds away from the whey and there's all this liquid left over. Same thing in tofu. That's called um, soy pulp or, or okara. Um, I've seen that used in chocolate making. It, you know, it's like a... It, it's dried up. It's like basically like pulp of skins and things. Um, it's dried and then used as kind of like a, a filler or um, something to give chocolate more shape and more, more texture and bite. And then there's also tofu skin or yuba. Um, it's kind of like when you microwave milk for too long and you get that skin on top. The same thing happens to soy milk when you heat it up for too long. Um, and that's a totally edible thing. Yuba is um, like a like a yellowy Japanese tofu skin, um, and I've had it a couple times. It gets dried and then reconstituted in broth a lot of the time. Um, but we should be eating more of that stuff. Uh, there is also a class of not not actually tofu, tofu. So just in name. It's called a tofu, but it, and similar in structure, but it's not actually soybean tofu. Like, there's egg tofu in some cultures, um, like chawan mushi, which is a Japanese egg egg custard. There's also um, chickpea flour tofu. I think that's more popular in Southeast Asia. Uh, almond tofu, uh, sesame and peanut tofu. All of these legumes and beans can be made into some kind of milk right and then from there the milk can be made into some kind of tofu blows your mind right <laughs> yeah crazy town let's see what else oh so dan dan c on twitter had a follow-up question to the tofu query um so how do we get hesitant people to eat it so I've also sort of been resistant to tofu, but I found a few textures that I like. I'm not really a fan of like tofu steaks or like dense cubes at like a salad bar, but I've, you know, there are more exciting ways to eat tofu. <laughs> so like deep fried is one of my favorite ways, like a, a pillowy deep fried block. So if you get extra firm tofu, you, um, you know, slice it into thick slabs and press that in paper towels with um, like a weight or like a, a, a baking sheet, sandwich it, and then like put some books on top and, and let it drain. Um, you can cube those up and freeze it overnight. And so what that does is as water is inside of the tofu, water expands. And so <clears throat> it freezes those crystals in place, those ice crystals. And then when you defrost it and drain it again or press it again, all that water is going to come out. So basically, you've created a sponge-like intricate structure on the inside of the tofu. So freeze tofu, defrost it, and then press it again, and you'll get like this airy tofu that you can now stir fry or deep fry. Yo. Some Asian stores actually sell these already like prepped. Um, some of them are called like pillow tofu, which is really good. They float in soup, which is adorable. <laughs> yeah. I also mentioned earlier having extra soft or silken tofu with soy sauce and chili oil is kind of like having a soft savory custard. Um, if, you, if you or someone you know does not like soft savory custard texture, adding crispy bits on top like bacon, fried onion, bunions, crushed up potato chips, those help. Crunchy things help. Like, think of like if you're a child and you love Lucky Charms for the marshmallows, how do you get them to eat the grains? You like toss the marshmallows with the grain, you know? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. But anyway, another great like tofu texture that I like is for firm tofu, I found this amazing vegan feta cheese recipe that's really good for snacking. 
Um, so you can eat it with bread or crackers. There's zero cooking involved, like absolutely zero cooking involved, which I think is a very attractive recipe, you know. Um, it's basically marinated in red wine vinegar, pepper flake, and garlic for like a couple days. And it doesn't taste like tofu anymore. It doesn't feel like tofu in your mouth anymore. It's kind of just like this refreshing, cold, like feta cheese snack. So if you just Google vegan feta cheese, um, you'll find all of these like marinated tofu recipes. Um, and I highly recommend them. Uh, also at Asian stores, you might be able to find crispy tofu sheets. Um, they're mostly used for a hot pot or dipping into a rich broth. Um, it's kind of like dunking tortilla chips into like queso before they get soggy. But in, in this sense, um, the tofu sheets are like have a little like layers that soak up soup and then you're like, get the soup flavor in between the layers. Um, I'm getting really hungry talking about tofu. Another way, another fun way to eat tofu is in Nari. It's a tofu pocket you can buy from Japanese stores. Um, you get these sheets and then you would m simmer it in a marinade. And then once they soak up all the marinade, you cool it, squeeze it out, and then you stuff those pockets with rice and whatever chopped vegetables you want. It's like tofu sushi. It's like the, it's like the wrapper. I'm sure you've seen Inari before. Um, I realized that I always have like tofu photos and, like, and I never show them. So this is a, a version of a, fr a deep fried tofu block. And then these, this is more of the marinated, I think some of that is cheese actually. It might be tofu cheese. Somebody mislabeled their photos. <laughs> But look at that. Isn't that golden and crispy and lovely? Um, but yeah, anyway, helping getting people to eat tofu can be difficult because I know it's like new. But you know what else helps? More flavor. Marinate it extra long, twice as long as you would marinate meat. Um, and because it's like a sponge, you know, it, it's going to soak up more and more flavor the longer you, you steep it. Um, and just have more sauce available on your table at dinner, like for people to spoon over it. I always like to have like a chili oil, like a lao gan ma, or a, um, uh, what's it called? Fly by Jing, or um, a salsa, a barbecue sauce, a plum sauce. Like having those extra condiments really helps with, with tofu. Um, but play with the texture, uh, marinate them a little bit longer, and hopefully you'll win them over. <laughs> That was for Dan. <laughs> oh yeah, Lucius endorses the Inari sushi. Okay, let's put another egg on me. How about the omelet? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Omelet is so happy to be here, everybody. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, how do we feel about tofu now, everybody? Is there something you want to try with it? Of all the things that I, I mentioned? Oh, while you answer that, I'm going to get ready for our next thing, which is asparagus that Lucius mentioned last week. So, let's talk about asparagus next. Wow. Tell me how you feel about tofu. Or tell me how you feel about asparagus, because we're going to talk about it next. Oh, I'm on the edge of my seat, literally. Let's back up a little bit. Oh, my nose is itchy. No. I need a drink of water. <laughs> Martin says, my CSA gives me so much asparagus. Well, good. So we're going to talk about it. Yeah, asparagus is in season. Let's, let's change up my twinkles here a little bit. I have one labeled cute. The name of this melody has been called meatball. And this one is called cute. I'm using tone pad. It's a free app. I use these in my skate videos. Okay. Let's talk about asparagus. So we eat the young shoots of the asparagus CAC class, Asparag asparagus CAC <laughs> class. It's also known as sparrowgrass uh, on account of its um, sort of 
feathery look on the tips. Let's let's look at a photo here. I have not the tofu, the asparagus. The sparrow grass. Look at that. Beautiful. I can tell by looking at the color of these that these are blanched. You can tell uh, by the color of the asparagus, like, either how cooked they are or where they come from. Um, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. So, how do we feel about asparagus, everybody? I want to hear from everyone else. <laughs> I know y'all lurking in there. There are ten of you lurking in there. Don't make me look at the chat list. I, re I recently discovered that there <laughs> there's, a, there's a users and chat feature that I can just call people out. I don't need to. I'm not going to. Just kidding. Oh, Mets is legit one of my favorite veggies. I did not get into it until later in life because of a few reasons that I will explain in a second. But that's great. I'm glad it's one of your faves. That we're going to be talking about it. So, the top of these asparagi are not actually leaves. You think that they're leaves because they kind of come off, but um, it's part of a modified stem called a cladode. Clad, cladode, 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 C-L-A-D-O-D-E-S. C-L-A-D-O-D-E-S. Sorry. Cladode. Cladode. Um, those are not the flowers because the actual flowers uh, are bell-shaped when they actually grow and sprout from, from the head of the asparagus. Um, so those berries and flowers are poisonous to humans, so we only eat the stalks. Um, it's known for being a diuretic, something that, you know, helps you produce more pee. <laughs> and an aphrodisiac, which is kind of gross when you think about it, but kind of amazing at the same time. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> those two facts together kind of <laughs> mess me up in the head. Like... A diuretic and also an aphrodisiac. <clears throat> so asparagus has been pictured in Egyptian friezes or artwork as an offering as early as 3000 BC. So these are, you know, older than, than tofu, essentially. Um, this is really cool. A recipe for cooking asparagus is given in one of the oldest surviving collections of recipes, Apicus's 3rd century BC, De Re Coquinaria, book number three. And there are a few people who went on to translate um, Apicus, and it recommends cooking the asparagus in boiling water, rursum, which is translating to mean backwards. So the recipe in the original, like, you know, 3rd century BC technique is um, a bunch of asparagus to be stood stock side down in boiling water, so boiling it upright. Um, so that the water doesn't reach all the way up to the, the delicate stalk. So this way, the boiling water tenderizes the thicker bottom while steaming the top. So no mushy tips and no tough stalks. Genius. So how do you get a bunch of asparagus to stand up in a boiling pot of water? Uh, don't use the rubber band that it comes with. <laughs> use a piece of kitchen twine to tie it together, right? And then uh, you'll be able to stand it up like a bouquet. But before you do that, when you prep asparagus, um, you kind of want to cut off the really hard uh, or snap off the really hard bottom. So when you have a piece of asparagus, I'm going to pretend it's this pen for a second. Um, the, the tip here, this is the pointy end of the asparagus. And then the cap here is the uh, bottom. So what you do is you, you take your finger and you, you kind of take it with your thumb and feel like where it's gonna bend at the bottom and then snap off the bottom of the asparagus. I mean, for chefs, we kind of just generally cut off like the bottom two inches, but sometimes if you wanna go one by one, you can, you can snap them. Mm, yes. So, uh, asparagus has so, so many applications. It's 3,000 years old, but you know, so. Uh, there are lots of ways to prepare it. It can be steamed, it can be stir-fried, it can be blanched, it can be roasted, be cut into ribbons vertically with a peeler. Did you know that? Uh, it can also be grilled. Just make sure to use a skewer to thread all of the bases together so that they don't fall into the grate. Or, you know, if you're grilling asparagus, uh, make sure that you're putting them on uh, 
perpendicular to the grill grates. So if the grill grates are all going this way, make sure all your asparagus are lined up this way so that they don't fall into the cracks, everybody. Gosh. Ugh. So where do we get white asparagus? This is fascinating. White asparagus is still the same species, but it's just made by covering the stalk with soil as it grows. So like if the asparagus starts to peek out of the soil, they just keep putting more soil and it just keep growing and they put more soil. That's very tiresome, but that's how you get <laughs> white asparagus. Um, so it never turns green. It never creates that chlorophyll um, because it's never exposed to the sun. Um, there is also a purple version that you might see at farmer's markets, but that uh, originated in Italy, which is really cool. So asparagus originates in like maritime habitats. It thrives in soil that's too salty for normal weeds to grow. Um, it's said to be a useful symbiotic companion for tomatoes um, because tomato plants repel the asparagus beetle. It has its own haunting beetle. Um, and asparagus may repel some harmful root nematodes that affect tomato plants. Love some symbiosis. Dang. So you'll see that um, a lot of gardens, they, they'll plant asparagus next to tomato plants. Great. Um, the thing about asparagus, it's quite the investment. Um, it can take three years from seed to harvest. That's a long time to wait for asparagus. Um, the great thing is though, once asparagus starts growing, it provides you with vegetables for about 20 years. So if you're going to start planting it at home, just get ready to wait. <laughs> um, my favorite way to eat asparagus is wrapped in prosciutto and then pressed in a panini grill. Cause then the prosciutto gets all like bacon crispy and then you grate some Parmesan on top as it melts like, whoo, it will smoke up the whole house, but it is worth it what are some of your favorite ways to eat asparagus um let's see green and purple asparagus are the same genus and class not the same species you know just how uh there are different colors of carrots you know there's purple carrots um it's just regulating the amount of chlorophyll in it i don't know where the purple comes from i should look into this uh, because it's not beta carotene. Purple is from blue and red. And orange is from beta carotene and carrots. So, hmm. Good question. I'll try to look that up next. Yeah, you like to roast asparagus. I like to put lemon on it also. Lemon and parm go really well with asparagus. Um, another favorite thing I like to do is uh, eat a soft boiled egg and dip the asparagus into the egg yolk. Oh, Martin likes it sauteed with butter and onions. Nice, nice. The great thing about asparagus, it doesn't really take long to cook at all. Hey, Robert, nice to see you. Usually roast asparagus, but stir fried some last night. It was yummy. Matt agrees, sauteed is really good. Eric roasts asparagus with firm to tofu, garlic, and sliced onion. Very nice. Everybody. Y'all are asparagus experts. Asparagus, asparagus experts? No, that was bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I've seen um. I've seen someone make a savory asparagus flan before. I've seen asparagus terrine, which is a um. It, the asparagus is blanched and then uh, pressed in a in a loaf pan like pate. It's really beautiful. Um, what else? As usually white asparagus is served with a soft egg and hollandaise. Uh, how many other ways? There are so many ways to eat asparagus. But you know, if they overcook too long, you get that funky smell, you know. So um, short and sweet is the way to go. It's okay if they still have a little bit of like bite to them. You know, I kind of do like them just barely grilled and still a little raw. Um, but yeah, I can tell that the ones in the photo are blanched because they're so bright green. Like uh, raw asparagus has more of a mellow green and uh, when you blanch things, it brings the chlorophyll to the surface because you've broken down so many of the cell walls. 
So this bright green asparagus has been blanched. Beautiful though. All right, let's put another egg on me before we move on to our last topic. Okay, everybody, uh, real question here. How do we feel about spam? I'm talking about this. Not the email spam, I'm talking about can spam. How do we feel about spam? I have opinions. <laughs> we'll get into it in a second, but I want to hear, um, you know, what is your experience with it? Um, when was the first time you had it? How do you like to eat it? Um, while I get some of these items ready here. Check on, check on one of my ingredients. Lucius grew up with Spam. Great. Martin ate a lot of Spam in college. Amazing. You've been exposed. It's exciting. Exciting development here on the stream. I'm doing, trying to do more live stuff with the cooking. My rice is, is good. Okay. So... Let's talk about spam, baby. Let's talk about you and me. All right, so what do we know about spam? I grew up with it. We always fried it, um, but did you know? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna experiment with this. Um, I did not know that it was fully cooked. Oh boy. Fully cooked, ready to eat, cold or hot. To fry, fry slices in skillet until golden brown on both sides. To bake, place slices on a baking pan. Bake at 425 degrees for 10 minutes. To microwave, place slices in a microwave safe plate. Heat on high, one to two minutes until hot. I would put a paper towel over it because it splatters. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to eat it raw uh, or, you know, out of the can. Uh, let's see. Eric says, spamsy log. That is something I'm going to talk about. Yes. Uh, Lucia says my parents would make spam and egg sandwiches. Delicious. Uh, Martin says lots of musubi. Yes, in fact, I'm going to make some after we talk about it. And Lee, hello. Is that Michelle? Grew up with it most often in kimchi jjigae. Oh my god, that sounds great. That sounds delicious. Oh, yum. Cool, let's talk about the nitty gritty of, of spam. Okay, so what is so scary about it to you? Is it because it's gelatinous or that it comes from a can? Like, I get it. It has like a, a poverty connotation. Um, so people shy away from that. And uh, maybe if they knew a little bit more about where it comes from and how more people eat it, they'll understand what, what its deal is. I, for one, love it, of course. Um, so Hormel introduced canned cooked pork product, Spam, on July 5th, 1937. Feels kind of strange that Spam was born after Independence Day. <laughs> that makes it 83 years old. It became really popular during World War II due to the difficulty of delivering fresh meat during war. Um, it was incorporated into many other aspects of the war. I didn't know this. Um, Spam grease was used for guns. The cans were used for scrap metal. Every little bit helped, you know? In the UK, the population depended on it while they rebuilt their agricultural system. As a result, people got super tired of it. <laughs> and so like, you know, when <laughs> that's how the association with poverty came from is that people got really tired of it and like, tried to buy other things. Um, and this is where that Monty Python sketch was born. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you Google Monty Python spam sketch, um, it's basically two people in a restaurant and they go, what's on the menu? And the cook just screams, uh, we're gonna have uh, eggs and spam and eggs and bacon and spam, eggs and blah, 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 lobster thermidor with spam. And then the woman, <laughs> woman, you know, cause Monty Python wasn't, women at all uh, <laughs> uh says do you have anything that doesn't have spam and the cook's like no you know <laughs> um this is where the email spam comes from because email spam is unsolicited much like the people forcing spam on the customers in the sketch didn't know that insane oh great that is you michelle nice to see you thanks for hanging out this is like the most people I've had in the chat, like actively. This is great. So very glad you're here. 
Your bread is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> All right, other names for, for spam. Um, there's no real, like origin story for the name spam like i think it's like secret among hormel executives but it could just come from spiced ham it could come from special army meat ham that didn't pass a physical is one of its nicknames meatloaf without basic training or hawaiian steak that makes a lot of sense so with wartime occup occupations um Spam got brought to Guam, Hawaii, Okinawa, and the Philippines. So that's where we get Spam Masubi, Spam Fried Rice, and Spam Silog, which is what Eric mentioned earlier. So Silog is um, garlic fried rice <coughs> and then fried Spam on top. So Silog in general in, in the Philippines is like garlic fried rice with an egg and some other meat. And so we have these portmanteaus, Spam Silog or... Um, Tosi log for tocino, or uh, baksi log with bacon. Amazing. A uh, whole nother episode of the stream. Um, in Puerto Rico, there's a sandwich uh, called uh, Sandwich de Mezcla, which is Spam, Velveeta, and Pimentos between two slices of bread. That doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> I'd, I'd actually eat that. That sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially like pimento cheese with like spikes of ham in it, right? Like it's spam, yeah, yeah. So what was the appeal back then in 1937? It is affordable, available, and it lasts forever. This hermetically sealed can lasts forever. What's it say? Best Buy, January 2023. <laughs> on, the, on the bottom of mine. <laughs> uh, so most spam you find in stores is made in Austin, Minnesota. First of all, I didn't know there was another Austin. Um, Austin, Minnesota is also called Spam Town, USA. <laughs> there is also another uh, factory in Fremont, Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> what you'll find in Spam Town, USA is a restaurant, Johnny's Spamorama. <laughs> Johnny Spamorama is an all spam menu, just like in the Monty Python sketch. <laughs> uh, so what is the dang thing in here? What is inside this can? So spam's basic ingredients are pork with ham added. And so uh, it's mixed in with salt, water, modified potato starch, which is used as a binder, sugar, and sodium nitrate, which is a preservative that we use in a lot of cured uh, meat like corned beef, um, salamis, uh, anything that has like a long, a long curing process, um, sodium nitrate is used. Um, so it is, well, the natural gelatin is formed during the cooking in the tins. So the, the meat is put in here with all that stuff and then cooked in the tins on the production line and that's where that gelatin forms on the outside. So this is really strange. This was invented to promote the sale of pork shoulder, which was not very popular. But if you look around today at, you know, all the really popular recipes in like barbecue, pork shoulder is super, super popular. <laughs> like that's insane to me that it was not popular during the war and that they had to package it this way for people to like it. And so understandably after war was done, and people really were sick of canned stuff that, they, you know, there's a resurgence in culinary development, that more recipes come around for pork shoulder and for ham or just avoiding ham altogether because you were sick of spam for all those years. So I'm sure that there's just like a generation of people that recoil at the thought of spam <laughs> or pork shoulder for that matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> that really boggles my mind that people in America were refusing to buy pork shoulder during war. Like, I, hmm, that's a lot, that's a lot, that's a lot. All right, so I have a list of all of the types of Spam. So there's Spam Classic, um, which is the original flavor. There is Spam Hot and Spicy with Tabasco. There's a different one that is Jalapeno. There is a black pepper one. Um, there's <laughs> low sodium, 25% less sodium. Um, there's spam light. I can't believe that low sodium and light are two different marketed things. So light is 33% less calories, 25% less sodium, and 50% less fat. 
but still made from pork with ham and the addition of mechanically separated chicken. So more of like a chicken nugget texture. Whoa, okay, I'm curious about Spam Light now. I kind of want that. Um, there's Spam Oven Roasted Turkey, um, you know, coming around Thanksgiving time. They have Hickory Smoke. They have a uh, spread, which is more of a pate in a can shape. Um, there's bacon flavor, there's cheese, there's garlic, teriyaki, chorizo, and I didn't see this, boricua. There's a Puerto Rican style flavor. I bet you can only get that in Puerto Rico. I haven't seen it. Um, there is also a Hawaiian partnership um, for spam macadamia nuts. I don't know if I could imagine like chunks of macadamia nut in, in the spam. <laughs> There's also spam turkey, uh, spam tocino that we're gonna break open soon, uh, spam Portuguese sausage. I'm not sure why they didn't call it just linguica. Like they've said tocino and chorizo already. Why didn't they just say linguica? I don't know, whatever. Um, and then late September, 2019, like jerks, they released a Spam Pumpkin Spice, which I do not want. I know, I know, Matt. Like, all these delicious sounding flavors attached to Spam. The light is kind of gross. Oh no, Eric, really? <laughs> but you, pr you like prefer the low sodium. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, I totally get that. Spam can be really salty. And I, I totally get that, um, this gelatinous, like, nastiness on the inside can be off-putting to people. But the idea of Spam, like, I've written about this um, on Medium a couple times, but this actually, this, you know, uh, low-class idea comes from a high place. So, I mean, haven't you had pate before? Haven't you had, like, terrines? Um, essentially, this is like a pork terrine. It's steam. It's like steamed in the can, and uh, the consummate, you know, gelatin is a normal thing in like French cooking. Like country pate is chunkier than this stuff, and I think, in my opinion, country pate is a little gross compared to spam. I like spam more than country pate. Um, but if you know if people have a hard time getting over the idea of spam, like think of it as this is just a uh, you know pork pate that has been fully cooked already, right? And pate is liver. Like, if you have a hard time getting over over fully cooked pork, then liver. Like, man, yeah, rethink, rethink your <laughs> your culinary preferences. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, we're gonna make spam musubi, or I'm gonna try to. Um, there are a lot of really fun parts of this, but it's super easy if you want to try it at home. I'm gonna get my little. Let's put one more egg on me. Uh, I think hard boiled egg. Hard boiled egg goes on the microphone. Oh, smooth, smooth egg. Here we go. Hiding. There you are. Okay, so I'm gonna lower this here so you can see my chest <laughs> and, my <laughs> and my prep station here. We'll move some of these back. Okay, cool. So, several things are happening here. Um, this is a tool I bought, uh, it's, see, you know, like, a lot of people don't like unitaskers, but this is a spam slicer, or a tofu slicer, essentially. It has guitar strings. Oh, you can hear that. Oh, it's a horror movie. Um, you just put the block on here and slice down, and it makes 11 slices for you. I bought this because, uh, we had spam masubi on a wedding menu like a couple years ago. This is for Mitchell and Adam's wedding. Um, so that's why I have that, otherwise I would never have bought it. <laughs> we have premium sushi nori. We also have, this is exciting, a rice cooker next to me. Let's see, if I can bring that over. Nope. Oops, I'm dripping hot water all over my leg. Still trying to figure out how to do live demonstrations while I'm sitting at my computer station. Um, and I have this really cute Spam Misubi mold. Adorbs. Adorbs, right? So it has a little tamp. Okay, 
So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the can of Spam open. So I have Tocino flavor, which is, I got from the Filipino store. Very exciting. So it has a ta tab on the top. You open it. Woo! Smells like ham in here already. You peel it back. So looking at it, it's uh, much darker than uh, the regular Spam. This looks like more of like a cooked meat product than regular Spam. Regular Spam is like light pink, which can be a little upsetting for people. It still looks like uh, raw ground pork, but this looks like it's been, you know, cooked. So Tocino flavor is uh, a Filipino sausage that is, um, it's got a lot of sugar in it. And um, achuete or, um, what is achuete in English? Anato seeds, which is the same coloring agent as chorizo. So Tocino, a sweet sausage from the Philippines. So this is, whoa, that came out really easily. And there's not a lot of fat in there. So that was not off-putting. Great. You know what, I'm gonna save this as like a planter. Save your cans. Pandemic is a sort of war, isn't it? All right. So we're gonna get my little cutter. Adorable. And then just push down on this tab here. <laughs> you can see that it's going through. Yay! Now I have 11 slices. I'm not gonna eat 11 Spam Masubi. I'll put these in my store. <laughs> okay, so we get the mold. I know, Michelle, you asked earlier which way I was gonna do it. Um, I'm gonna do rice first for one, and then we'll see if I have enough to do the sandwich. So we get like a spoonful of rice into the mold. Cute. Usually when you're making like a onigiri or like a, like a rice ball, you put salt on the bottom before you put the rice in or you put salt on your hands as you're working with it so it doesn't stick to your fingers. But because spam is so salty, um, we're just not gonna add more salt. <laughs> okay. So I have my, my rice in here. I'm gonna get a piece of my spam. You can see that the spam is a little too short for the for the mold, but that's okay. And then we tamp it down. Cute. And then we take the mold outside mold off. And then we have the cute little block, buddy. Next. We need some nori. Should have opened the nori before my hands got all spammy. Gross, Jen. I'm gonna have to wipe this later. <laughs> Aye. Hello, open please. Give me, hello. Oh no, okay. <laughs> I have to wipe my hands. <laughs> okay, hold on. Breaking the demo. One second. I think I opened it. <laughs> All right. Nori. Beautiful, beautiful Nori. Got half sheets here. I don't need this knife right now. But, got my adorable. So you can do several ways. You can either wrap the whole thing or use half sheets and wrap only the middle to keep it attached, but I'm gonna do a whole. Look at my adorable little Spam Masubi. So you can also, oops, no. <laughs> Sharper knife, Jen, jeez. I squished out the other side of that one, but essentially, Spam sushi, spam masubi. You can go higher with the, with the rice. I just don't. <laughs> I, I would only eat one piece of spam if I if I doubled it here. You can go the full height of the mold if you want to, but just depends on how thick you cut your your spam. Oh, sorry. 
flavor-wise. Mmm. The Ticino flavor. One of the ingredients here. Ham, sugar, water, modified potato cornstarch, flavorings. So generic. Doesn't even say what the flavorings are. But it does say paprika. I think I prefer it fried. I think um, later I'm gonna I'm gonna fry some of the spam. Um, my favorite, my favorite um, spam masubi was um, after a really long flight to Hawaii, and it had been maybe ten hours since I ate. We went to some gas station, and there was spam masubi that had presumably been sitting in the warmer all day, like, you know, eight hours. And it was tightly wrapped in plastic wrap, which is sort of dangerous, you know, heating plastic wrap like that. Um, but it was packed tight, like the nori was not crispy anymore, and it had been glazed in teriyaki sauce, and the teriyaki sauce was like seeping down into the rice. I was so hungry, and it was like the best thing. Best, best feeling. Mmm. All right. I can see how eating unfried spam is I, but I prefer the crispy edges. But Ticino flavor is delicious. Mmm. It's kind of like a sweeter teriyaki, not with so much soy. It doesn't say on here if it's gluten-free or not, so there probably is soy sauce. Yeah. Anyway. Whoop. The rice cooker is making noises. I turned you off. So, how do we feel about spam now, friends? Mmm. Let's see. Yes, yes, Martin, secret recipe. And, um, Lucius asks, it's usually fried spam and spam masubi, right? Well, um, I've seen both. I've seen uncooked and cooked. Glazed with egg or with cheese and sandwiched. Mmm. Alright, I'm gonna eat this one. I'm not gonna make another one. I'm not gonna eat all of it. <laughs> but I will take a picture if I do the sandwich version. I kinda wanna do another one later. But. Um. Oh, let's play our game. So let's try to mash up. Um, let's do, let's do the, um, ooh, deep fried musubi. I would eat that. I've had deep fried spam before, like spam tempura. There's a place called Swell Dive in bed -Stuy that's like a Filipino taco place, and they do a spam tempura taco that is really good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's do our um, chopped exercise a little differently this time. Let's mash up asparagus, spam, and tofu in a dish. And if somebody wants to mention one more ingredient that we toss in there, we can like try to brainstorm together like what what dishes we can come up with. So if you're new to the stream, we for the last like couple minutes of, of the stream, we try to mash up ingredients like we're on chopped and come up with new dishes and new ways to combine everything. So today let's do spam, asparagus, tofu, and then one more mystery ingredient, the first person that says so in the chat. So. Well, I eat spam masubi on camera. Mmm. It's just gonna be a spam masubi channel if <laughs> no one says anything in the chat. <laughs> Peanut butter. <laughs> Peanut butter. Okay. All right. You can mix and match all the ingredients, so you can use two of them together, or you can use all four. Like it's just all about exercising your brain and. Um, understanding how each of the ingredients works and how they can work together. So to give you some inspiration, tofu, we mentioned earlier, can be silken, firm, it can be fried, it can be steamed. 
Spam can be fried or eaten raw or pureed to make a pate. Um, asparagus, we said we can be roasted. It can also be pureed into a soup. Oh, wait, okay. So what if we did? I'm always, whenever you say peanut butter, I always think curries. Mmm. So what if we did like a peanut curry soup? Like fried asparagus, like crispy tips. Use, we can fry some spam and like use the fat to fry the asparagus. And do like I don't know. I, I, I like frying all those things. Fried tofu, fried spam, fried asparagus in a peanut curry soup. That sounds fun. Peanut butter and tofu sounds like a good like protein booster. Like a peanut butter smoothie with a little bit of tofu mixed in would make it thicker. You know, get you through the day if you really needed to use it up. We could do a steamed tofu custard with like um, asparagus inside of it. <laughs> yeah, good for gains. Yeah, gains. <laughs> mm. What else? What can we do with spam? Oh god, okay. Stay with me. What we could do is puree all the spam, right, into a paste. And then put some in the mold, put some asparagus inside, put more spam on top, and then re-steam it so it <laughs> it makes a spam block with like asparagus chunks that you can like <laughs> slice. Ooh, silken tofu with peanut butter squirrel. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, Lucius would use tofu skin to wrap some asparagus and a slice of spam with a dab of peanut butter inside. Ooh, interesting. Yes. Yeah, we could do peanut butter and sriracha in that little combination, too. Ooh, yuba. Ooh, okay, wait, wait, wait. So if we had yuba, we wrapped it around the asparagus and fried that. That would be a crunchy thing that we could dip into peanut sauce. Mmm, that sounds good. Yum. We could just have like a little soldier's plate. You know what that is? Um, so like that, that thing I mentioned earlier with a soft boiled egg, like in a cup, and then you dip the asparagus tips into it. You can also do like fried fingers of spam in the egg <laughs> also, and then deep fried um, tofu fries also. What about, uh, Robert says, something like a dry fried green bean with asparagus and crumbled spam. Ooh, mapo. We could make it like a mapo tofu, but it has deep fried green beans and asparagus and crumbled spam instead of crumbled uh, pork. Wow, yeah, that sounds good. Mm-mm. And then just, we could, you know, dry the peanut butter into like a dust or like peanuts. You know, sift out all the peanuts. It's really fun to like take apart dishes like that. Good thinking. That was great. Anyone else have any more ideas? I think those are all great. Cool, we're learning things that we're using. I mean, we're using things that we're learning. Excuse me, that was a spoonerism. Do you know what a spoonerism is? I'm prone to spoonerisms. I, I think too fast where I switch words and sentences sometimes, like syntax is wrong. In my head it's correct, but when I say it out loud it's incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, spoonerisms. Um, that reminds me, there's a cartoon where people are from Spoonerville? What cartoon is that? I don't know why, but that's probably why it was named that way. <laughs> anyway, random, random thoughts. Does anyone have any more questions about asparagus, spam, or tofu today before we sign off? My hands are very spammy right now. <laughs> oh, I forgot. The other way that I know spam is from the Save Ferris song. Do you know that ska band, Save Ferris? They're from Orange County, and they I loved them in high school. They have a song called Spam, and it's, you know, got a brass section, and 
Yeah, one of the lines is, uh, my mom told me to eat it for dinner. She said I grow up strong like Bruce Jenner. Song does not hold up in 2020. Y'all. Okay, friends. Um, that's it for today. Uh, if you want to cover, I need more topics for next week's stream. Let's see, do I have any for next week already? No. So I'm going to be back June 3rd, and I need topics to discuss. So maybe we'll look into purple asparagus. If you have suggestions, you can either say so in the chat here while I'm still live, or you can DM me on Instagram or Twitter with your ideas and things you want to learn more about. Or if you have a recipe that you like don't want to try yet and want me to dissect it, I love dissecting recipes and seeing where you know we potentially can go wrong. What makes a good smoothie? Good question. Okay, we'll add that. Anyone else? Well, thank you for that. I'm glad to see you all. This is so nice. Thanks for hanging out with me on a Wednesday. So after this, I'm going to continue um, prepping food for people. I'm doing deliveries tomorrow. If you want to check out my store. And I'm doing pickup on Friday in Greenpoint. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to be writing a lot and, and working on other things. Cool. I'm going to play some, some twinkles for you while I clean up. But thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And I'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Or this Sunday if you want to hear me talk about zines, 12 p.m. Eastern this Sunday. Bye, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs>